Thanks for the audio check, Tim. Considering I was the disaster of audio with my awesome rig on your very first podcast, I appreciate it. All right. So it's just uh, two minutes after, just to give another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll jump in. I've got a, a few things to share with you folks. Um, Christine is assisting me. She runs one of our businesses and uh, is an awesome help. Um, she's already advised, and Christine, once in a while, if you can drop that into chat to remind folks as well, those who just joined new don't see the history, historical chat. If you have any questions, fire them in chat or use the webinar Q&A. So why don't we just get uh, get things started off and, uh, and and get moving? I'm going to be talking today about uh, what happened in 2021. I will try not to mention COVID more than I just did, um, as well as what's happening, what we're seeing coming in 2022. Um, it's been a pretty crazy year in many many fronts. Our agenda: a quick intro, a the, what I would call the major happenings. Now I would say major. Um, I highlighted in red for a reason. One is that I'm going to miss some. Some of that's intentional. Some of it was, right, totally forgot that happened because 2021 seemed to be a very long year. As well as what's going on in 2022, the trends to watch and Q&A, as I mentioned, send them in through chat or use the Zoom questions. Um, Christine will monitor those and, and likely interject in the middle of the presentation if necessary, if warranted. Um, just a quick who, who, who is this guy? Um, if you don't know me, I'm Daryl O'Donnell, founder and president of Continuum Loop. We're a boutique consultancy focused on uh, decentralized identity, aka SSI, self-sovereign identity. We uh, typically operate ranging from minor, tiny, not minor, tiny startups through to the largest of organizations, including big financial institutions, governments, military, large corporations, uh, not-for-profits, um, and various different NGOs. Um, also, you may have seen some of the information that we created, which is the Walt Report, which was dropped a couple of years ago. Um, if you haven't read it, I suggest you get the SSI book, which chapter nine is the Wallets and Agents. Uh, Drummond Reed and I authored that uh, and, and editing a 90 page report down to, apparently it's the largest chapter, but it's a, uh, it's a big topic, but that book has been uh, very, very helpful for many. I don't know why that's animated. I must have copied a slide. So quick summary of what we'll talk about, then I'll go into the detail. We're going to talk a little bit about Good Health Pass, the SSI book, um, that governments are slinging code now, the Evernim acquisition, and the launch of Checked. You'll see why each one of these is important, and I'm kind of on a different theme, each and every one of them. Um, it's also why I selected these kind of five topics as the 2021 uh, topics. So first off, Good Health Pass Collaborative. This was an effort that kicked off, I guess it started off in late 2019 um, in relation to something that caused a travel shortage or travel halt globally. I mean, I said I wouldn't mention it. Um, but really part of the question came out and Charlie Walton, who will play it again in, in this story, uh, was at MasterCard at the time and was trying to basically help the world understand when it comes to digital identity, what does good look like? The Good Health Pass Collaborative was established and, and, and really its primary use right now is aimed at re-enabling international traffic, uh, international air traffic. You have a real problem when it comes to digital identity, identity in general, when you're talking about that specific space, add in, I'll say it, add in COVID and you get a really weird mix. You have nation states who are beholden to no one. Um, Issuing passports, that's a really well-known thing. You know, IKO is involved and that's a well-known process. But now we have to carry along health credentials that range from a scrappy piece of paper through to a QR code that only works in the country of issue. So you have a real problem of how do you merge all of these things together? So what the Good Health Pass did is, is help build a blueprint that shows how we can get to a global level solution and really, I look at it as a blueprint for general data sharing. Yes, it was focused on international air travel with the health ramifications and health requirements, but the same patterns apply broadly. The blueprint was issued in, I think, mid-2020, 2021, sorry. And it became kind of a good guide for um, what are the pieces that are needed, all the way from governance 
Um, I led the trust registry side. We'll talk about trust registries a bit more later. Um, and, and what we're going to need as far as the standards and where they are, the standards, the specifications and protocols that are necessary to wire this beast up. And it's a very complex beast. What we learned out of it most was the value of going in and not talking. Uh, I'm one of the founding members of Trust Over IP. Um, the governance part of Trust Over IP is hard. It's also really hard to take a look at it and think about all the details you need until you go through a really complex and concrete example. So we actually invested uh, many months of time from Continuum Loop into Good Health Pass and came out of it. And then we've now been assisting a few clients on lighter aspects of governance because we're, they're not trying to solve a global problem, but they are trying to solve a regional or smaller scale. Some are actually going full regional, full global. Um, but so the blueprint itself is great document of how is a, what's the starting point. Parts of it are still awaiting the standards to, to, to finish. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and we're seeing examples where people are looking at it, the shape, the size of it, and using that in different spaces. Um, one of the things we learned was missing was this concept of this trust triangle we've been talking about for years, is that it's wrong, it's kind of missing, and it's not a triangle. And the trust registers are critical. I'll explain that quickly. It's the only detail we're diving into this one. And if you've been to um, prior webinars, you may have seen some of this. So just uh, bear with me. It won't take long. But when we talk about the idea of issuing a credential from an issuer to a holder, so let's say the government is giving me a health credential that says I got a vaccination, <clears throat> vaccination um, credential. And then later I need to present that to a verifier. So I need to go to a restaurant on a very nice simple case, or I need to pair that with my passport along with my travel credential to get onto a plane to leave the country. And the idea here is that the issuer gives it to me, I present it to the air, air, airline, and the airline needs to trust that issuer. But how do they know to trust the issuer? Good Health Pass really exposed this deeply. They know on passports who to trust. ICAO manages all of the keys for that. There's a very rigorous process, and we don't see countries standing up every few days. Where things fell down quickly was even inside of a country, is this lab real or not? We saw tons of fake stuff. Um, governments pushed out paper that was easily no security features of any kind. So how do you prove this stuff? It's really hard. So the verifier realizes, I don't know if I can trust the issuer. And that's a real hard question to solve when you only have this triangle. Um, Charlie Walton, again, the, the gentleman from MasterCard, he's now at Avast, again, they'll play a little bit later, um, realized that we needed that governance authority to say, hey, listen, there's an issuer here and we put them there. We manage the list of issuers who are authorized, who are, sorry, authoritative for a particular type of credential. This lab is okay to issue a PCR credential. This country is issued by managed by ICAO to issue passports. Similarly, we may have, we may want to limit the verifiers um, of what types or, or how they may ask for a proof. As an example, um, I may limit those people who are allowed to last, uh, sorry, allowed to ask for a full driver's license. I may let anybody ask for proof of age of majority using a driver's license because they're not getting my name, phone number, height, weight, birth, and God knows what else is in there. And they use this through a governance framework. The governance framework sets the rules by which the governance authority manages these. And that's the critical part. <clears throat> and that is where the trust registry falls in. This is managed inside of a trust registry. We'll get into the detail of that a tiny bit later. Another big, big thing that dropped in May, and I, I, it felt like it was a lot longer ago because I, uh, I keep showing it off my, uh, my autographed copy from Drummond and telling people to read chapter nine, which I wrote. Um, apparently I just do that too often. It wasn't that long ago. If you're looking for it, it's available through Manning Press. You can Google SSI book, self-sovereign identity book. It's the only one that comes up that, I've, that I have found. We have found, depending on who you are, what you're doing, there are chapters that are absolutely critical for you to read and there are chapters which won't mean a damn thing and they're confusing as heck. Um, that said, it is by far the best resources, best resource out there. I would recommend reading the wallet and agent chapter there as opposed to the report, unless you want the extra detail. Um, 
Christine, if you make a note as well, well, I've already got a note on the trust urgency webinar. We'll add the wallet update. We did one a few months back on that too. So you can have that in hand. I'm not going to talk too much about GAIN. GAIN is the, uh, I don't even know, Global Assured Identity Network out of the IIF, the international, I don't know what the I stands for, Institutes of Finance. Basically, this is the biggest banks on the planet issued a um, large federated system that is aimed to try and simplify digital identity. I bring it up just for completeness in that it's a, it's kind of an old school approach. It's definitely not a decentralized, it's more centralized. Um, but the goal they, they have there is how do banks help their customers sign in to various different places? So instead of signing in with Google or Facebook, um, that you can sign in with your banking credential. Um, this has been tried on multiple country levels, and I'm not sure where it's going to go. Um, I jokingly referred to those who are old enough to know Spinal Tap. I'm like, this is, um, you know, if you adjust the gain on an app, you can say in Spinal Tap terms, you know, ours goes to 11. Um, moving on from that. Another neat trend that happened is that governments are actually slinging, slinging code um, in a couple different ways. Globally speaking, there are at least 10 different governments, whether they be a national or uh, regional, provincial, state level, that are either coding directly or enabling. So I'll give you an example. One of the projects we advise on is um, a Canadian province that's working with multiple provinces to work towards, not yet, but work towards issuing digital identity credentials. They're exploring the technology, seeing what the bounds of it are, looking at the overall framework and seeing what, what it would mean to issue to a citizen. Um, as another example, Germany has got multiple projects. They've created at least two ecosystems, uh, Lisi and ID Union, where th they're not coding directly, but they're helping fund and inspire startups and large companies to build out and follow a particular pattern um, so that they can start seeing what does it mean? What does it look like in the wild? Um, and other countries, Netherlands, Finland, um, at least 10, as I mentioned, different government bodies. Now they may be in, in the same country. But what's interesting is they're all doing the same thing. They're taking Hyperledger Aries and Hyperledger Indy as the predominant solution. And I look at that wondering what the heck is going on. Um, it, it's interesting to see because I've been involved with both Aries and Indy since before they were called that. Um, I remember the, the agent to agent discussion, which became Aries and Indy was sovereign, and before that, it was Evernim, and they'll play again later. Um, but I was wondering, why? Why are they doing this? And there's really two different trends that are happening here, one of which is data sovereignty. Um, there's some information. Um, Christine, if you could just make a note of this, too. Um, the government, the UK government and Canadian government have really good policy pieces issued by government on why open source helps, as well as what the concepts of data sovereignty mean. But the kind of, my quick summary of data sovereignty means that the country, the nation state is recognizing that in some aspects of what they're doing, they cannot lose control. They cannot trust that a vendor will come in and say, we're open standards, we're interoperable, um, and know that they're not going to be one tied to and or held back by the vendor. And the vendor, for that matter, may walk away from the space and leave them hanging. So they're asserting and requiring that they both learn as well as execute to a certain level so that they are in control of what they must be in control of. My motto, our motto has always been uh, control only what you must influence the rest. They need to control this one. This is one where losing control means you have absolutely lost control of the beast and you may be stuck forever. Additionally, I'm looking why Hyperledger Aries and Hyperledger Indy. The answer really there, it is, it works well enough. It is sufficient to get the job done. It lets them look and, and explore uh, the user experience with the citizens. What does it look like to ask for a digital driver's license if and when you do that? What does it look like to be offered a digital photo card if and when you do that? It's a really weird user experience when you go pure digital. It's not the same as handing someone a card. Um, what if you hand them a physical card and a digital credential? So they're looking to do this, but also wanting to understand all the deep crypto behind it, the security behind it, the how do they recover? How do they revoke things? 
So the hyperledgerase and Indy frameworks allow them to um, accomplish that. I think they're also seeing, which I'll talk about in a second, some convergence of things so that they know that this is not a dead end, that there are similar pathways that they can take that may not be a one-way road. Big story happened, end of, it was funny. Uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the companies we advised was talking, uh, Matthew Glode from Northern Block was talking to Charlie Walton at Avast, apparently the day before this was announced. And Charlie's just, a, I mean, don't ever play park, poker with that dude. Um, <laughs> no hint that things would happen. And the next day they, they announced the, the acquisition, which obviously that kind of thing doesn't happen immediately. But I have no insider information on it at all. I purposely have stayed away from my close friends uh, until at least after this to hey, get the casual type stuff, but I have no insight. But my thoughts are, I'm looking at why would a vast, a consumer, I think they have business in some enterprise stuff, but largely speaking, consumer um, security play. You know, I, I used to be a hardcore user when I was a window guy of AVG Free. I think that's for them. They've now, uh, they're also merging with Norton LifeLock. Um, why would they acquire something like Evernet? If you read the wallet report or go to the wallet webinar, you'll hear me talk about a couple of things that scare the hell out of me. One of which was wallets is backup and recovery. I need to know that someone is gonna help me recover the things that I lose. I'm deep in crypto. I am terrified of losing my keys. I, um, I have no idea where I put some things. Yes, it, I should keep them in the safe. Guess what? I found one thing hanging out the other. I'm like, why was this there? I almost threw one out. I have thrown out keys. Uh, I, I mined a Bitcoin a long time ago. No idea where it went. If I have a partner who is doing and helping take care of my security, and if you read the wallet chapter, it's actually called Digital Walls and Digital Agents. I need someone to help take care of the mess that digital identity has already become. And will get messier in some ways, much crisper and cleaner and logical in other ways, but I need people to help me with that. Maybe that's what Avast is looking at. Um, that's what the biggest gap is, is the wallet and how it is backed up and restored and protected. And the reason I say protected is if your recovery process is weak, that's where you get attacked. You're only as strong as that step in your, in your overall security protocol. Um, last one here, I think, is Checked launched in, uh, in, in, in 2021. Checked is really the first native um, token enabled SSI network. When I say native, I mean, you can run identity on, on any number of ledgers, but like Sovereign, which runs on Hyperledger Indy now, the network was created to support identity, not as an incidental, this supports identity. There are other networks, by the way, we have one client that's working with Cardano um, working on Cardano, that, that is similar, but they do many, many things. Checked does identity. It does identity on Cosmos, which by nature itself is intended to go cross-chain, so it allows some flexibility. <clears throat> Additionally, it is Hyperledger Aries compatible um, it, because it, it runs on, on, it's anchored to the Cosmos chain, not to Indy. But because it's Aries compatible, this means we can start using the same thing as honestly layer one, where you have Sovereign, where you have uh, in, in, in Canada, there is a Canadian network being stood up that governments are going to run in time. Who knows where that's going to end up? Um, you really don't want to care about layer one. You want to know you can trust it. You want to know it's secure. You want to know that it's going to be, it's highly reliable. And then you want to forget about it and let the, the Uber geeks worry about that a little bit because it should just work and be very boring, honestly. Um, the Cosmos is an interesting network. As I mentioned, it goes cross-chain, allows for more baked-in interoperability. They're focused in, and, and for disclosure, the note here, I am an advisor for Check, and I do run some nodes um, because we have customers, a couple of reasons. We have customers asking, where is this going? How, if it's a, if it's a token-enabled network, how does a customer who doesn't want tokens play? It's like, oh, okay, we have a fiat gateway. We need to know how to do that and how to work on that. But additionally, it's, it's understanding where are the SSI, the self-sovereign identity use cases. So imagine that holder being issued a credential and maybe having to pay for it, maybe being paid to hold it, a verifier potentially being paid, but there's value being transferred 
um, when you're using these credentials. Some people in the SSI space consider that to be anathema. Everything should be free. I'm like, good, good luck running. Um, that said, I think the SSI space can get to the point where, where there's real value added, there is an expectation that some of that value will be extracted into the network, which ideally would be more diffuse. So we're looking at the SSI, the Web3 crypto. Web3 and crypto talk a little bit about trends as well. They're, they're recognizing that you know, the not your keys, not your token, not your coin uh, solution is great, except keys to an address being identified solely to you is problematic. Um, and they're starting to recognize that there's other pieces here. So, so check is taking a look at this. How does identity fit in with other stuff? And just general use cases where it's the performant network and the preferred choice because it's cheaper. Who knows? They launched uh, testnet and mainnet. Mainnet launched, I think, at the end of November. So let's change topics here. Actually, Christine, you said there was a question. Sorry, yeah, we have a question on trust registries. Um, just want to know, do you foresee these registries mm. being uh, run in a centralized or decentralized manner? Do you um, th think of any leaders and uh, what business models have you seen? Perfect. Awesome. Um, I like these questions. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to probably mispronounce your name, but Moises, the... the, the um, Registries are going to be centralized and decentralized. If you take a look at con as a concept, as, a, as an idea, um, the good health pass, just the health credential side of that. There is nobody in charge, yet every country has an authority somewhere. Um, and they may have deferred authority to another country. But take uh, just Canada and the US as simple examples both of which um, there are really, yes, there are national authorities when it comes to pandemic response, but I think both of them, largely speaking, and there's some health budget at the federal level, but both of them are, um, they have, there's more subsidiary uh, control. Provinces in, in Canada are in charge of delivering health care. Similarly, states as well as the private system in the states gets even more unique. Then you get into the who's certifying the labs and stuff. In every case, there's likely a centralized body that's certifying that list of labs, list of healthcare providers. Um, in, in, if you look at lawyers and professional engineers and accountants, I'm a, a professional engineer. My license is managed by Professional Engineers Ontario. They're the authority by regulation and legislation to manage licenses. So there's likely a whole bunch of centralized. So it is a decentralized group of centralized agencies. But down the road, you can imagine a virtual, a truly decentralized trust registry, perhaps on, on, on reputation, on um, who's a good KYC provider. Whoops, I, I'm clicking my mouse here, sorry. Um, so so that, that can be both centralized and decentralized. As far as um, who's leading, there are no tech leaders right now. Um, the groups that are leading, in my view, in our view at Continuum Loop, are the ones who are already aware that governance is very important and may be able to point to places where the governance is already there. As an example, a prior client is the BC government. They have issued credentials now for multiple millions of, of uh, corporations that are registered in British Columbia. They are, by legislation and regulation, the authority. At the federal level, we have Corporations Canada. They, they are the authority and they can issue that. And that's already covered because they have a mandate to publish corporate registrations. That's it. How they publish it? Well, it's on a website. You can get your printout if you want it. You can have it on an embossed paper if you like. And you can have a digital credential. That already exists as far as the, 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 the leaders and who's doing it. And then business models is a really good question. This is something we've been working on with several groups is, how do you work inside of an ecosystem so that you can start the ecosystem up um, and have it sustain itself? And this is where we're looking into what's called you know, high value credentials where there is a value to someone. Um, I won't name the client, but they got a call from a health insurance company saying, listen, we know your, your customers are doing KYC and they're, they're holding your credential. Can we just ask if someone has a credential? We don't want their account number. We don't want their name. We just want to know that they are holding 
a credential issued by a financial institution. We're like, yeah, you can do that, but why? They said, we have so much fraud that we're willing to pay five to $10 because that saves us so much time and money that we'll do it. I was like, huh. So the, the business models are really shaking out. Typically there's many, what I've seen, and we've worked on many, there are a lot of, this should be free and it's correct. But there's also a lot of groups who, who derive direct value and are willing to pay. The problem is if they don't have to, if everything is free, you have a problem, you have a problem supporting the system. If it's mandated and funded, perfect. So I'm going to jump on to the next little section. We've got a question here too from Tim. Um, he wants to know, are there any uh, sector agnostic trust registry protocols and or standards yet, or is the generic concept still very uh, early days? Yeah, there's, uh, um, Tim, at, at Trust Over IP, there is a, an early stage um, protocol that only does three things. It allows you to ask a trust registry, is an issuer authoritative? Is a verifier authorized? And that's really the two main questions that start the stuff. Um, in our trust registry webinar from the fall, and again, that'll be linked, it's linked in here uh, elsewhere. Um, we do discuss the next stage. You know, uh, what are the credential types in an ecosystem? Who's allowed to see it? Uh, what, uh, what proof requests are normal? But we're not there yet. So it's the, is the issuer authoritative? Is the verifier authorized? And a third one do you trust this other trust registry? So I could say to, hey, Canada, do you trust the US trust registry for health credentials? Yes, cool. All that does is give a signal that says, Canada is, says, says is both trusting them and willing to say they trust them, which gives a signal that to another player that maybe this one is useful. If they go into it 27 times and get 27 yeses, they're probably trustworthy. But it's very early days to, to your point. And that one is at a version one and just going to the community this quarter. What do I do here? So trends to watch. We're going to talk a bit about this convergence I was talking about, a little bit about um, standards and some shakeup that's happening, um, as well as some convergence specifically in credential exchange that's, uh, that we're seeing. Um, anyone who's heard me talk about premature interoperability, we're still there. But there are good, good pieces coming out. And to the questions that have been coming in, trust registries are starting to become much more urgent. And this is something we realized um, in, during the Good Health Pass effort that it was really important to nail these things down because no one could answer the question, do I trust this issuer? And that's why we, we spent so much time um, and effort on it. So let's talk a tiny bit about orchestration and convergence. This is a sort of a soft topic. I don't have a lot of crisp things, but what I'm sensing and seeing and hearing, hearing a lot, especially on podcasts, is it's really interesting to listen to a podcast that's talking about um, pure crypto wallets, um, talking about the security of those, and someone saying, yeah, we're kind of realizing that, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're realizing that having just the private key tied directly to an address is a problem. It is too identifying there is no, you can call it pseudonymous, but the minute I have tagged you, I now know you for the rest of your life if you're using that address and everything that happens upstream and downstream of your particular uh, crypto sitting in that wallet. And they, start talk, they started talking, there's an A16Z who's um, deep into uh, Web3 now, but they're one of the old school VCs um, from Silicon Valley. And they're now talking about decentralized identifiers being a good way to separate the address is from the person and or the identifying information that's necessary so that we don't do things like directly tie an address to a KYC credential and or personal information that we've now, we can never get away from. So we're starting to see people are recognizing that. When you add in governance, people are recognizing, if you look at the web, the, the crypto space, I'm not going to call it web through the crypto space. The hardcore crypto space, you know, initially was, you know, burn the government, libertarian, that side of it um, was, you know, not your, not your keys, not your coins. Um, they're the ones who are starting to recognize, ooh, um, I, I, I don't want to hold my keys. I don't. I certainly don't want to hold my keys. 
hey, I need some recourse if this thing goes sideways. In some ways, they're rebuilding some of the financial and banking infrastructure on top of Web3. Why? It's because of the social contracts and stuff that we need. It's because of the governance we need, because it's not the same as handing. Um, I just uh, uh, accept an offer for my house. Um, there's a whole process to go through for, for the monies to move into an escrow account, check all the boxes, then move it over here. I don't want to do that with just a single press of a button that I might screw up. We're starting to get these things being rebuilt. Some of them are far faster and better. Regardless, the governance is tying and converging on top of both generic blockchain and crypto, as well as the identity side. There's also been a bit of a, a standard shakeup. This kind of comes back to, it's an ongoing battle. It started in uh, last year, but it, it's ongoing. The W3C, um, where DIDs and verifiable credentials have sat for multiple years, I, I was actually in the room when we were discussing where should it go. And um, I don't like being right, but I was right on this one. There's a fight right now on whether DIDs are being accepted because there's over 100 different DID methods out there. And some of the big browsers, uh, Mozilla, interestingly enough, um, Mozilla Foundation was the prime driver and Apple and Google were behind it as well. Um, Google a little less so, saying you can't do this. This thing is, 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 is way too diverse. Um, the, the funny thing is if you look on, um, I don't even know who does it, IANA -I maybe, who handles all of the little methods, the HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, SFTP, blah, blah, blah. The ones that handle all of those, there's hundreds and hundreds of those, of which you, in your day-to-day -day life, use handfuls. It's exactly the same as things were back in the original web, yet they're fighting against it. Why? Because they're browsers. They think the browser is a wallet. It's not. Another shakeup is starting to happen right now in discussions is that the W3C credentials, and this is one that we're, we're not, I'm not sure where this is going to go. There's no direct way to, to formally tie a credential to me that I'm holding it. I could do it using a subject identifier, and then you need to know what the subject identifier even means and that it's me. And we immediately have correlation. So there's no immediate way to do some of the privacy preserving things that we've all been talking about. And it's been very difficult to get changes through on that. So there's gonna be some probably some churn over there is my guess. Some of the groups, especially these governments who are, who are, who are jumping in are, are recognizing a standards basis that they need to understand wallet security as well as differential security, meaning how do I have a wallet that can handle multiple levels of assurance of credentials? How do I ensure on the wallet security side that you haven't had a family member um, take your phone over without you knowing? and or that, uh, uh, that a credential has been moved, it was backed up and moved to someone else's wallet. Um, kids nowadays are asking for people's expired driver's licenses um, uh, because it's an easy way to get into the bar if you're underage. There's a digital concern there because you can make that a lot faster, if you, especially if you don't have holder binding. And if, you will, if your wallet allows movement and backup of, of credentials. Um, there's also some shakeup as well as convergence. What's really interesting is the Hyperledger Aries and Wacky Pex, which is over at Diff. I'll talk about that again. Um, they're different. They do the same thing-ish, but they're starting to, I think, recognize that, that, that this is a good thing, that they've kind of come to the same answer. And interesting enough, Hyperledger Aries and the patterns in Wacky Pex are exactly what the governments are pushing on to. Talk a little bit about credential exchange, specifically that last little bit there. So we're seeing the same patterns form. When I issue a credential to you, I need to, you either need to ask for the credential, I need to offer it to you. And then we have this back and forth that happens behind the scenes, ideally. You don't want to see this in the computer. It's really, really boring. The dance that occurs to finally say, okay, here's you, you you're you. Okay, cool. Put that in your wallet. You got it. Thank you. Good. Issuer is now done and disappeared. And then that interaction between the holder and the verifier that says, yeah, hi, how do I talk to you? Do, I, do you present a QR code to me? Do I present a QR code to you? Are we doing Bluetooth? Um, am I getting a text message from you? How do we start talking? What do we, how do we go back and forth? And this, it looks so simple in this arrow. This arrow is really messy. And it says back and forth and the verifier says, yep, cool, I got one. Oh, and the verifier may ask, say, hey, listen, I don't want your whole driver's license. I just want to know that you're age and majority so you can drink. 
or I just need to know you're a citizen of this particular country and you're good to go. All of these things have to be figured out. What's really cool is, and how do I, so I missed my slides here. So how do I ask for and get and share the credentials? I mentioned Hyperledger Aries and Wacky Packs as, uh, as, as something that's happening this year, because I believe this is when it's really gonna happen, this shakeup between the two. They're doing the same thing. How do I get you a credential? How do I use a credential? We get into the, tr the trust risk side in a moment, you know, how does the verifier know that that's really a bona fide issuer? But they're talking about exactly the same exchanges. They're making very similar things. Now, there's going to need to become a shakeup moment when they come in and say, listen, one of the groups is likely to say, hey, listen, here's how you do wacky packs on Hyperledger Aries, or here's how you do wacky packs with a test suite. Hey, Aries, it's up to you to comply. And I think we're going to find some of that back and forth in between um, both Hyperledger Aries, which is at Hyperledger, um, at Diff is wacky packs, which wacky packs, by the way, stands for Wallet and Credential Interface Presentation Exchange. It's a weird name. It was called Killer Whale Jello Salad at one point in time. That's a IIW oddity that I really don't understand. But what's cool is they're starting to talk and starting to see how do we do this together? And the patterns are so similar that it's like watching going, okay, cool. You're doing the same thing. Just get your, get your ish together and let us know how the standard is. Talk a little bit about interoperability. Those who know me know I've been talking about premature interoperability and premature standardization a lot. <clears throat> it's really early days on interoperability. Um, the, there are many different pieces here that are problematic. The one I just described to you, the credentials exchange is hard. It's not done. Um, even in Hyperledger Aries, there's a test suite that people regularly fail and they go, ah, oh, right, I broke it again. Go multi-protocol, now you're into a mess. But here's the funny part. You tell me you're going to give me a W3C credential, I'm immediately asking, okay, cool, what type? Because there's at least three, I count four, depends it's how you count them, totally different types, which have totally different aspects of privacy, some ranging from there is none. Basically, I give you an identifier that correlates me everywhere, and I give you all the information, can't hide anything, through to there's zero knowledge proofs, which allow me to hide uh, things I don't need. They can say, hey, listen, I'm over 21, but I don't have to give you my birth date, um, and I'm not going to show you my name type of thing. There's this spectrum of them. Each of them are different. Um, one of them actually doesn't actually fully work yet because there's still some crypto issues to be solved. So just that thing. The, the, the here's a credential. I'm not, this is a coaster, but I'll use it as a credential. Great coffee, by the way. Rampage coffee. I don't, I'm not associated to them, but I drink my body weight in it all the time. If I give you, a, if I say I'm going to give you a credential, you need to know which of the four types it is. That's cool. That's a big picture. What are the attributes and where the hell do I find them? How do I know about them? There's a lot here. Then we have that whole exchange thing, which it gets messier even faster. But if you take a look at the, what am I doing in my ecosystem? You can simplify what I would call points of interoperability. How do I take a particular credential and use it in various different ways by verifiers? A, uh, a good one would be, this is a, a health pass, a good health pass, where I can walk up and people can know that, yeah, the green check mark isn't just a graphic. It's not just like an NFT, it's a JPEG. It is actually backed by something in our wallet, our wallet saying, yep, good to go. That's interoperability is at the point of point of engagement and all of the pieces that have to happen. That's the only places where interoperability, one, is worth pursuing right now. Two, it's achievable now. Anything beyond that, you're, whoever's selling you something is, you know, it's problematic. I'm going to talk a little bit about trust registries and see if we've got any more questions that are going to come in. Please do drop them in. So trust registries were mentioned, actually, I realized they were mentioned back in 2019 in the, um, the wallet report. Um, we mentioned them as something was happening last year. But I think the trust registries are really coming into their own this year. The reason I say that is we're involved with multiple projects that, for business reasons, have to deploy trust registries this year. They have started out small enough, and this is inevitable. Um, we're working on one project where the network is a defined set of entities, and it's by virtue of being on the network, you're good to go. 
So we can't suddenly have a high school student issuing a driver's license because they can't even get on the network to, to write to it. Um, I, would, I would be the high school student in issuing fake driver's licenses, by the way. I'd be the, acting as the slowest state or, and or province because I would just make sure I stay ahead of them. Um, the difficulty with these trust registries is the minute I just say, okay, cool, it's a closed network. No one else can get it. Oh, but this guy's really kind of like us, but not quite. I would give the analogy of if it's government, I'm in Canada, we have things called crown corporations. It's, it's an agency, it's a corporation owned by the government, typically operated under a not-for-profit basis, but it's not government. It's an agency of government. It's not a normal corporation either. So it's not like it's a bank. It's, uh, well, the Bank of Canada would actually be, I'm not sure if it's a corporation. Canada Post is an example. Um, some of our nuclear agencies they're really government-like, but the minute they got on the network, I now have to ask questions. Oh, okay. Some non-government folks are on here, even though they're pretty close. And then the minute you go the next step further, you are now, you must have a trust registry because you cannot possibly know everybody on the network. This is the analogous to the days of anyone has seen the diagram that shows uh, the nodes of the internet. It has spots in Utah, it has spots in California. There's only about six... 60 different connections or something like that. It's the same as that. Everybody literally knew everybody. And then everything went sideways when it got too big to manage inside of your brain. And you have attrition of people. And once you get into thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people, you simply can't do it. And that's how we ended up with this internet we have right now. It has no security based on identity at all. So what's happening is it's formalizing. I realize my specification word is now covered by, by trust register, by the diagram. Um, as, as Tim asked the question, we do have the um, specification going through. It only answers the first three questions, which are, is this an authoritative issuer? Is this verifier authorized? And does this trust registry trust that other trust registry in a particular context? The next steps are, um, how do I know what credential types are valid in a particular trust framework? Um, how do I know what pre presentation requests? How do I know what wallets are valid? That's actually a big one right now with the governments is the wallet side. Um, there's no easy answer to say, oh, anybody can put out a wallet in the wallet report. And I think in the book, we talk about uh, whether we can trust Bubba's wallet. So I need to know, can I trust that wallet in the trust registry? Things get hairy pretty quickly on that, but that initial piece, <coughs> excuse me, if you have that initial piece of, is the issue authoritative? Is this verifier authorized? And do I trust that other trust registry? You start to build the ecosystem properties. So this is also what we're finding at trust registries. Every single governance framework that we've worked on ends up asking the question, well, where do I put that information? Where do I put the list of issues? Um, you can put them in a database. You can put them in a config file. But if you can't expose it to the outside world, you've missed the point. And by the time you need to put it in a database, it is the outside world is your problem. So we're finding that every single governance trust framework project we're working with is stepping into when will I deploy and whose trust receipt will I deploy? What's good news on that is if you're building a good governance framework of how does an issuer get into the system, you have all the business stuff figured out of how do I know you're a bona fide lab for this particular type of test? Who's the accreditation agency? What are the rules for getting you in? How do we get you out? Um, if you don't pay your dues, when do you expire? All of that stuff. Adding an API call that says, hey, is this issuer trusted to issue this credential type under this governance framework? Yes or no? That's actually really, really easy. So adding the protocol support is really, really easy. Ensuring you have the management and the governance and the trust framework behind it is the harder part. Um, we do have a webinar back from uh, 2021 that uh, you may want to, I guess it was, uh, I to remember, yeah, it was September or so, that we'll link to in the, in the notes that we provide afterwards that dives in deeper into the trust registry side. That's uh, principally it. So do we have any more questions, Christine? I think we had some that were pushed in beforehand. Do we want to look at some of those? 
Yeah, yeah, I have some here. Um, one of the, one, one that was most interesting to me, um, what scares you the most about uh, 2022 and beyond for SSI? Uh, it's still back up in recovery of wallets. Um, the, the, the thought that in time I'm going to, <clears throat> people aren't recognizing a couple of things. I'll talk about sort of crypto wallets. Crypto wallets where you have to remember your mnemonic, your whether it's 12, 15, or 24 words, depending on how you've done it. If you lose that, you're in deep trouble. That's a given. We know that that's a problem. The problem with, but when you have that, if I lose my phone and I have my mnemonic, I got to download an app, type it in, it's painful, but I type it in and boom, goes back to the blockchain or chains, reads everything, boom. I have everything I had because I, my wallet is just a pointer. It's just pointing at something and showing I control it. It has the private key for it. That's it. The difference with a digital, digital wallet, an identity wallet, it may have the only copy of the stuff, whether that is a driver's license. Now, if I lose my wallet today, I'm going to uh, service Ontario to get a new one. I could do the same thing in a digital space and the governments are getting faster and better at doing that in an onboard, an online way that is secure, that is going through the processes of validating it really is Daryl, not someone trying to rip off my identity. But what about other sort of incidental things? I have a, I just sold my house, realized my ice maker is broken in my fridge and I need the warranty that was in my digital, it was actually on my computer, but I didn't use the analogy, it was in my wallet and I lost my wallet. Well, how do I find that? In my case, I was able to go to my email and find, okay, here's the vendor. I can reach out to them um, and find out and they can help me, hopefully. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm buying a new fridge. That's scary in many ways because I get it. This is my world. Most people won't even understand that. There's no apps that have a catastrophic failure mode in the, in the real, the, the normal internet world. We need to get past that. My guess is we get past that by having, and uh, this is a, a terrible phrase in the Web3 world, a trusted third party um, that I can rely upon. This is my, hint, my hunch why a vast acquired Evernet. They are to us trusted third party. They protect people's devices, ranging from phones through to uh, uh, laptops to servers. Um, that might be what they're seeing, not sure. But I need to have a trusted third party. The key difference is, I need to be able to move away from that trusted third party. That's where the decentralized world allows us to truly have portability. Um, you'll hear, you know, I can download my Facebook information. Um, as Christine may tell you, I'm not a Facebook person. Um, I can not. download it. I'm a you know, recovered software developer, database guy. I can look at the file and say, oh, cool. I can see what this is. And there's nowhere to put it. Absolutely nowhere on the planet to put it other than Facebook. It's of no utility to me. I can't say, hey, that relationship with a GUID is, oh, yeah, okay, that's, that's Christine, perfect. Well, that's not gonna help us, doesn't help anything. Whereas a portable wallet that I say, hey, listen, I've just changed law firms. Um, my lawyer has my will. They're also part of my recovery network. I don't trust the social network because if you, and by the way, if you trust me on your social network to help you, you recover your keys, don't do it. I'm not, I can't do my own. I don't wanna do yours. But if I can go to my lawyer and my bank and have two of those parties, both of which are legally in deep career ending trouble, if they steal my stuff, I really have a, a good, um, good answer there. So that's really the thing that scares me, I think, uh, uh, the most still, and it has for three or four years. So that kind of would lead me into the next question. What about the MDLs, the mobile driver's license? I didn't hear you um, mention that Apple supports them now. Right. So Apple supports them on a technical basis, but my understanding is they've held off and are going to be doing it this quarter. Um, MDL is interesting. It's got a lot of really cool things. The coolest and most important of which is the is that in theory, I can use it without unlocking my phone. That's pretty powerful. There are in the States, I don't know what amendment it is, First Amendment or whatever, that, or Fifth, that you cannot, uh, and in Canada we have similar, I just, we don't have a particular name for it that I, you know, comes to mind. Um, 
I don't have to unlock my phone if it's if it's with a code. I don't have to give that up to you. But if I have to do that every time I show you my driver's license, I've already unlocked it and the cop takes it, boom. We have a we have a whole different legal issue there. That's one capability that's really, really cool. Um, the rest is it's really proprietary. There are vendors who are running it, um, which is great. You, governments don't write their own stuff on this usually. Um, they need to have the how do I do revocation, you know, image checking and, and all this stuff, all the quality checks that there's a large vendor network that does this and does a good job that do the printed ones. But when I issue that credential and it goes onto my phone, yeah, sure, I could show it to you. Again, I may have to unlock my phone. But if you need to verify it, so imagine I'm pulled over in rural Ontario. I just drove across Algonquin Park um, and regularly zero cell coverage. If I'd been pulled over there, they have no ability to check that um, unless they have the full MDL reader software, which means I've now tied a vendor into the mix and Ontario Provincial Police may have it, but what about the small town police? Do they have to now buy that new equipment? It's not open enough is my problem with it. It ties things into the vendors and it doesn't have enough of the controls. That said, it is a step forward in many, many, many different ways. Hopefully that helps. Okay, I got another one uh, that was sent in here. Uh, did you hear about TB Dex and what Square uh, and Block are doing? Yeah, <laughs> Tim's on the call too. Um, so I, I didn't realize that TBD X, so TBD is like, I guess the new business unit is to be determined. Um, so TBDX is a, is a money and identity. So that's part of that convergence as well as a bit of governance piece that Square slash Block and TBD, this new business unit that may spin out in time, pushed out that is kind of aligning um, the crypto world, basically the business problem is trying to solve, which we have certainly in Canada. Um, I imagine in the States it's worse, but and internationally it might be easier, but just getting money to or from an exchange to work in the crypto space is really hard. It's really, really painful. You're either doing something dumb, like paying 3% to use a credit card, um, or you have to know how to do a wire transfer. It's just difficult to move money around. TB Dex, the intent is, how do they create an ecosystem that we can have someone who's doing KYC says, and we'll say, hey, yeah, I know who Daryl is. Um, I get a small percentage of the fees that are ripping through the network, but I'll stand behind Daryl. Um, and, and then I get to move money to you. You need your own KYC provider. And they're creating a protocol to allow, hey, how do, how do different institutions bid on this? to either be the on-ramp, off-ramp for the funding, to be the KYC provider. Um, so it's kind of a really cool, um, more structured approach to looking at this. We did something similar with one of our clients, um, Bonafide CEO Ledger, where we purposely separated, didn't realize it was novel at the time, um, moving money in between countries. In particular, we were looking at uh, Virginia, United States, moving money specifically to a credit union, from a credit union in the US to a credit union in Estonia. We basically, the credit unions, they're standing behind their members providing the KYC. They were the KYC provider, but we weren't sending the KYC information with the payment. The payment was routed across and because of the weirdness of, of Estonia and credit unions, they don't have SWIFT. Uh, we had to do it to an intermediate bank, SWIFT to someone, and then they used the thing called SIPA. So we had this weird ass payment Rail, sorry for swearing. And the identity was on top. What it, we also realized is it allowed us to do a lot more. Um, I just got uh, one of our other businesses, uh, Christine, you would know the business, just got a $5 test payment from a customer, from a government customer saying, hey, we just want to make sure we have your banking information correct. I'm like, I did that three or four years ago. People thought I was a wacko, um, but they're about to send more than $5. That's the only information you have is, can you please go check your account? Our model had, hey, I'm sending money to Uncle T Timo. Uncle Timo, Daryl's sending you money. Are you good with that? Yep. And our wallets figured out how to do it, Swift to SIPA. And then it said, hey, Timo, funds are there. As opposed to, hey, Uncle Timo, oh, it's middle of the night. Never mind, I'll call him tomorrow. This instantaneous connection we have over the identity and comms rail augmented the payment rail. Tim has commented here that... Uh, 
for TBDX, just add money to your identity, blockchain and governance. Yeah. But for me, Tim, blockchain and money, I guess you have your money. Good point on the fiat side is not, not there, but you have money to the, yep. Good point. Definitely. We'll do that. Christine, any uh, further yeah, questions? Yeah, I have, uh, we have time for one more here. Um, it's kind of two, but I can throw them in together. Um, where should I look for more detail on interoperability standards and how things are being put together? And then what kind of goes with this? Why are you uh, cynical about interoperability? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the first one, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll claim I'm, I'm biased. Uh, I am both a founding as well as a, one of the initial funders of the Trust Over IP Foundation. The, I would suggest going there and depending on where your focus is, there's two different areas to look at. If you're focused primarily on business and governance, there's the governance framework uh, working group. If you're looking at the overall technical architecture and how it fits with the governance side, um, look at the tech stack working group, which I, I chair. The reason I point at Trust Over IP is its mandate is more on the the business and orchestration side than on the developing of the particular standards. So it feeds into DIFF for some work. DIFF requirements feed back into Trust over IP for clarification. Um, it feeds into W3C. To me, it's a really good starting point, um, as well as the discussions aren't getting down into the bits and bytes necessarily. So that's what would be a starting point. Um, the, the cynical part of me on interop is, is this. If you can define what your interoperability problem is, you may be able to achieve it. Generic interop is a farce. Um, there's a reason why if you travel globally, it's a good idea to get an international driver's license because every country outside of a very small few does driver's license completely, utterly differently. And you have no clue whether something is real or not. So we now defer to the CAA, AAA um, of the world to actually do that. Um, I was involved in the GIS industry interop, which actually was, we cracked the nut in the nineties. Um, and what it did was reduce data costs by 90% or more. Um, the reason that you can now see, if you, if I wanted to see a picture of someone's cottage before, you're talking $25,000, like from, from above. Now it's free. I just zoom in on Google. That's all using the same standards. We haven't defined the frame of what interoperability is yet. So that's why I'm so cynical. People will point at it, we're interoperable. No, they're not. Simple as that. We got a question here uh, from Brent. Um, what's the biggest challenge or challenges the governments in Canada are struggling with on moving forward with digital IDs? I think the, I'm not sure that there's any sort of fatal challenges. I think the, what I'm seeing is, and I'm, I'm on the inside in some ways, is they're taking the right small steps. They're not trying to jump in without checking where the waters are. They're, they're learning the, hey, this is a bad idea. This is gonna be a problem. Um, as well as if we build something, how do we get out of it? Because the government doesn't wanna run a lot of this stuff forever. Some parts it likely will need to, but that's only very few things. So I think they're doing the right things by exploring. It just, it takes time. It takes time to build that both institutional knowledge to understand how the policy cover um, uh, works with the technology, how the technology either breaks or supports the policy cover. So overall, I think governments are, this is so new and different that the governments that are dipping their toes in the water, to stick with that analogy, are the ones who are not as challenged in, in my view. The ones who are not doing it, they just don't have a clue what's next. Hopefully that helps. We are, Christine, we're at time. Any more questions? Uh, no, I don't have anybody else uh, who sent anything in. That was uh, perfect. It. Perfect. I've, I've got to jump onto a board meeting, but folks, um, thank you very much. Kudos to you for, uh, for, for, for being here. And uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, Christine and I, mostly Christine, uh, will get you the uh, show notes. The, the overall links that we've talked about, as well as a present PDF of the presentation. And uh, we'll get that on, uh, on an email out to you in the next week or so. Thank you very much. Have an awesome Thanks, day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.